This interview featuring Tom Zebra, a Southern California activist, and Kelly Patterson, a Las Vegas-based activist, was recorded in May of 2018. So I'm Tom Zebra, and I just want to say uh, it's an honor to be here with Pete Ayer and Kelly Patterson. So this project right here, just as talking, is the most important thing that I've got on my mind. It's, it's my pleasure to be here with you guys. Thanks. I am Kelly Patterson, obviously. <laughs> and uh, I work with Nevada Cobb Vlog, and uh, I also work with Food Not Bombs Las Vegas. And uh, lately I've been doing a podcast, which is ACAB Radio Las Vegas. And it's on Facebook and YouTube and all that, if you just search for that. And uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Vegas, so I've been here and I've been involved in activism in Las Vegas for quite a while. If, if I could um, add please, to that, uh, I've been to the Food Not Bombs program and I watched Kelly feeding a, a park full of homeless people. And um, to say the least, I'm inspired to feed a whole park full of people, to drive up and unload the trunk and have all those people waiting. And that's um, it's pretty awesome. Why did you become involved with filming the police? I don't have a brilliant answer. I just. Um, at first, it was probably like self-defense, trying to defend myself and the people that were important to me. Over the years, that's, I, I think I just enjoy it now. It's like, I'm still passionate about it, but I, it's, I enjoy it. It's like, um, hard to explain, but the, as time has gone on, I think I'm more um, into it than I've ever been. I don't see myself really doing anything else than what I'm doing. Yeah, I think I'm kind of in line with that, but at the same time, I just, uh, I originally, I uh, started getting involved in Food Not Bombs Las Vegas and it was uh, kind of because there was a need for it and um, I originally met Charles Johnson back in 2008 and that was one of the things uh, we started what was called the A Cafe and we, we still do that and um, I that was one of the projects that he was working on doing so I got involved with that and there was a history of it here which is uh, the cops made it illegal to share food, which they've done in other cities. Las Vegas was one of the first cities they did that. And uh, so they had basically driven Food Not Bombs out of existence from the harassment of it, and we revived it. It, it was made illegal in 2006, we revived it in 2008, and we tracked down a lot of the people that were originally involved and, and got them you know, as many as we could back into it. Um, that was where I started seeing the, the police harassment because they were harassing the homeless people. And uh, I started working with Charles Johnson and eventually um, I started getting involved in cop block activities. And then I started Nevada Cop Block because my friend that I knew in high school, Stanley Gibson, got murdered by the police. And that's just basically like right now, I think it's really important to build community and to create systems that are something that the community is in charge of and you're not at the mercy of the state and the police and to build alternative methods of community policing so that you don't have the police coming in and aggressively um, controlling people rather than helping them. If it's a community-based thing, then the people in the community care about each other, so it's more help than it is control. When you have it state-based, and that goes back to Food Not Bombs, when you're, when you're sharing food with people and it's a community thing, you're not trying to control the people. You're trying to help them, and I think that's at this point why I do what I do because it, it's a way of building community and it's a way of um, creating systems outside of that authoritarian government structure that there is like that, that saying if you all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail and that's what the state does and, but if you're doing it as a community based thing you're seeing it for what it does for people rather than to people. What you were saying about the food not bombs Reminded me, um, in California, Governor Jerry Brown just signed a bill now. It's illegal for people to sleep inside their car. Right. So, like, 
I don't know if that means you get out of your car and sleep on the ground next to your car, but but it, it just feels like it's in line with what Kelly's talking about. Yeah. They're making it illegal to be homeless. Yeah, and they criminalize get, homeless. Yeah, yes. if you don't have any place to go, how is a, um, a penalty going to, how is that going to help? So instead of trying to help these people now, we're trying to punish them when they obviously, they've already given up and, you know, I don't think any more punishment is going to help. And like, people, one of the things that people try to say about Food Not Bombs is that we're preventing people from using government services. And the reality is they're not using them already. We're not preventing anything. Uh, we're filling a need that's already there. And that's part of the thing is they think if they starve people into submission, they'll be forced to use government services. So it's not, even then, it's not a humanitarian thing. It's a control thing. So. So that's like one of the worst, you know, misnomers of, of what's actually happening. People are outside the system because they don't want to be in that system for one reason or another. And there's a need there. And part of the thing is if we feed people, they're not going to go shoplift because they have food. But if they're hungry, they're going to go and shoplift. So you're, in a way, you're creating crime by criminalizing homeless people. What systems or strategies have you found effective? That's a difficult question for me. But I, I would, I've tried every, I've tried the official route. But the first thing I ever did was try the official complaint route. You know, and that landed me in jail, or landed it made me a target. Right, I was um, facing retaliation. Um, and then I, uh, I think went with the route of like lawsuits. You know, I thought, and I thought that was effective for a minute. It seemed like it was. You know, the police quit targeting me briefly, but then I think a few years went by and, and like, um, the staff was overturned. Like, it was all new faces on the street. And then, it, like, the process started all over again where I tried the official process again. And, you know, it, it went to where I ended up having lawsuits again. And it's like a, it's a, a never-ending cycle. I think the only thing that's ever worked for me is just being repetitive, like on their asses all, all the time, like, which is, I know most people can't dedicate every day or, you know, a portion of every day. So, um, but to me, that's the only thing that's ever worked is if, if someone treats, a cop treats me badly, I'll try to find them right away, like the next day or the same day, or, you know, as soon as I get out of jail. I think that's the only thing that works for me is repetition. I do whatever whatever I can if if, it, if I have to shout profanity from across the street if that's all I could do then you know I, I think that might be a last resort but um, I'm not above it so um, but yeah I try to be um, things may have changed over the years I try to be polite and respectful and, and just communicate with them but they're not always open to that idea so um, but if I had a game plan on any particular day I'm, I'm never I can never stick to it it just kind of like whatever happens because it's um, it's like dynamic I guess it's really hard to predict and you just have to go with with what you feel I think cool. yeah well I mean going back to food not bombs again I think that's one of the things um, they actually call they said that food not bombs was more dangerous than a terrorist because they said that we could change people's willingness to finance war so they actually said that, and they, um, they uh, investigated Quakers in Pennsylvania that were feeding people. And so that's one of those things is um, you find out really quickly when you do grassroots activism is that the government doesn't want anything that will allow people to understand that they don't need the government. So they, that's one of the reasons they cracked down on food, not bombs. And uh, I think... One of the things I'm working with right now is uh, the group that's uh, Families United for Justice. And uh, when I first started getting involved with Cop Block, that's one of the things we did is we tried to reach out to families. And we, we did our original chalkings and we, we branded them as vigils. And we really like paid, it, we, like, um, paid honor to the victims and their families. And, and we invited the families to come and we had some of the families come in. And this is kind of like a version of what we were doing, but with the budget and, you know, some kind of exposure and stuff. And 
So I'm really glad to see that because it's it's also a good way to to organize people and it gives the family support, which is something that's really necessary. A lot of these families, um, the one thing is when, when somebody's killed by the police, uh, if somebody's killed by a, a criminal, they have these different funds where families can get money to bury their, their uh, loved ones. When they're killed by police, they're not eligible for that. So a lot of times the police target poor people, so they can't even afford to bury the people that the police kill. And so they need a lot of support. And also they demonize those people to try to justify what the police did. So it's really important that we support the families and that having them involved is also a powerful thing because you can see that it's not just that they killed that one person. It affects everybody around them. So I think that right now is probably the most effective thing that I'm involved with. You know, Mike, you already, you already said it, but what came to mind was character assassination. You know, like when, once they kill somebody, even if the person is innocent, they automatically and continuously like assassinate the character of the person who's already a victim of the police yeah. violence. Right? They dig up every crime they've ever done, and you know, it could be 20 years ago. You know, Tasha Brown was murdered uh, Mother's Day last year. They were pulling up DUIs from 1996 and, and trying to make that like this justifies us choking him to death, you know. And that's just the way it is. They, they want to justify what they did, they want the public to feel like this guy was a criminal, so you know, what you did was justified. So they do everything they can to make that person look bad and look like a criminal. Yeah, to me that's a distraction. Like 19, a DUI in 1996, who cares? I had one in 1991, I hope that doesn't mean they could kill me today. And if you look at the police, if we had access to what the police have done since 1991 or 1996, you know, that's, a, that's what they, people should be talking about, not about the, what the victim happened with the victim 20 years ago or whatever it is. And that's another thing that they do with the homeless is they will stop them for any reason. They'll stop them for jaywalking within a residential neighborhood. And that allows them to build a record against the homeless people. And the, the justification that they use for that is if they commit a serious crime, then they have a record that they can put them away for real time. But that rarely happens. Most homeless people are something happened in their life and they're, they're you know in a bad situation. There's a lot of people that move here to Las Vegas and try to, you know, make their way and then they're away from their family because they moved from somewhere else to here and they don't have that that security net of their family or their, you know, long-term friends anymore. So if they lose their job or something, they are, they're homeless. And when they build that record against them, now they can't get a job because they have a record. So they stay homeless longer. So they, they make it worse under this, you know, the auspices of protecting the community from these dangerous criminals that make up a very small amount of the actual homeless people. How did we get here? I, I don't can't say how we got here, but, um, and I don't, and I have no idea how we're gonna get out of where we're at. Um, just about any time I read a newspaper or see a news story, I could just watch it after being involved for so long, I could watch, hear what they're saying and it's the same, it's the same story that they told a thousand. It's like they don't even personalize it to the incident. They just tell the same bullshit story. So like I could go to the um, the scanner app and like pull pull the audio from what really happened. Like right away, if they say they shot a guy in the in the in the leg or something, without hear, hearing any more of the story, that just sounds like bullshit. And then half the time, if I pull the audio, they'll they'll, they'll be calling for. Uh, you know, um, emergency for the fire department, it'll be like gunshots to the back or whatever it is. It's, there's never one gunshot to the leg that I've ever, that I recall. But I recall plenty of times of pulling the audio and finding out the truth was there were several gunshots to the back. Um, and I'm not even sure if that answered your question, but I just know that I don't believe whatever their story is, it's even when there's nothing wrong with the real story, they tend to not tell the the truth. I don't know why they don't tell the truth when the truth would work just fine. But my experience is they don't tell the truth ever. Even when it would, even like when the, yeah, it doesn't make sense. They have to sugarcoat it or, I don't, I can't explain that. I, I think probably you guys have experienced that too. I, I'm not. Yeah. Have you well, explained I mean, that? 
Metro is kind of notorious for basically an evolving storyline. So they put something out, and then uh, two days later, something else comes out and you know contradicts it. And a lot of times, their original story is completely different than what they finally settle on. You know, a week later, and part of that is they know people remember what they hear first. So if you say you know this person attacked the police, that's what people remember. But the thing is, like, I think when you watch, like, old shows and even documentaries and stuff from, like, the 60s and, you know, during the uh, civil rights era and everything, you hear the same stories. And that's the problem is a lot of times it doesn't change. So when I go out and do stuff, it's always with a thought to move forward, not, you know, when I go out to protest and stuff, it's not because I think yelling at the police is going to change anything. You know, there's a certain element of bringing attention to and, and letting people know about what goes on. But I go out to meet people and to make connections with people more so than anything else at protests. Because the protests themselves, you know, it might um, be kind of a steam valve where it, it lets people blow off their emotions. And, it, you know, and, and I like to think that sometimes you can talk to the police and maybe plant something in their head that they will miraculously understand that what they're doing isn't right but my real like I said I try to build community and what I do is when I go out is I want to meet people and connect with people and move forward from it and you get a lot of these people they go out to one protest and then you know hey we did our part and we get good, they go home but that shouldn't be the deal like the the actual protest is usually the least important part of any sort of activism that you do the real important part is connecting with people and making those those different community um, um, organizations that you can actually make some sort of change and not rely on somebody to change it for you. What's your message to a police supporter watching this video? I, I don't think, um, I don't know if I even have a message to police, police supporters because uh, for a lot of them, um, I'm gonna use uh, Ramsey Denison as an example. You know, he, he's a, a huge advocate right now. He's, he was working nonstop, like discussing things with victims and um, just meeting with them, interviewing them, trying to, you know, trying to send the message and trying to educate people on what's going on. But before the police beat him up, nobody could have told, nobody could have gave him a message and said, hey, this is what's going on. He would have, he would have never listened to it. it. He had to physically be beaten up by several cops for him to understand that that's a reality. And so there's a whole um, there's a whole percentage of our population who aren't in danger. I, I think that you know, depending on your class, your status, where you live, and, and uh, different uh, circumstances, there's a whole lot of people who only see the police as there to help them if they need help, and if they don't need help, they stay out of the way. So I don't think there's anything we could say to convince those people, because the reality is the police are not a threat to them. The police are actually there to help them. And the interesting thing is the same police that are, are building a good reputation with those people, they're the same people or the same police that are um, building a, ter a terrible reputation in the poorer communities. I've, I've experienced it. I know, I've seen and recorded the same cops making friends and, and um, you know doing positive things in one neighborhood and then seeing them abusing kids and, and poor people in a different neighborhood. And then I, at that time I realized this, the good cop, the bad cop, it's the same cop. So um, I don't know that I have, until, until they experience it, I don't think that some of these people will ever believe it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that. And when we had back uh, 2014 when they were trying to pass what was called the More Cops Tax, which was as the name kind of implies, they were trying to hire more cops by adding sales taxes. Um, there were people, we would go to the, the commissioner meetings and, and there were people saying, like from Summerlin, where the rich people live, who were like, we need more cops in our neighborhood. When we call them, they don't show up for you know five minutes or something. I was always like, you could have the ones in our neighborhood. You know, <laughs> We don't want them to show up, you know, because there is a complete difference, you know, and, and they have saturation teams here, what they call, um, and I'm sure they have them all around the country, they probably just have a different name, but basically they just descend upon a neighborhood and will stop people for anything they can, 
hoping to either catch somebody with something on them or find somebody with warrants. And basically it amounts to harassing an entire neighborhood for a small amount of people that are actually committing crimes. But there was actually an article in the Review Journal about that and one of the spokespersons for the police said, and this is a quote, we wouldn't do this in Summerlin. So basically he's saying, you know, we're targeting poor people. And so it is kind of, I think, like, like I don't have a lot of time for internet fights anyway, and I don't have a lot of interest in them, so I don't usually bother with them, but, like, I don't argue with, like, police lovers that much. When I do, it's usually I, something really sarcastic as a joke, you know, just to, but I think it is kind of, you have to document what's going on, and there are some people that are kind of on the fence, and if they actually see something, it'll strike them. But there are a lot of people, unless it happens to them, they're not going to, you know, do anything but believe in the police and, and blame the victims. So so I think it's just one of those things you have to, you have to build community within your own community and reach out to who you can and not worry about those people that you can't reach. What kind of gear do you use? My fancy GoPro that I carry with me everywhere. <laughs> like literally, I have this in my hand every time I'm walking around. But there's this. That's a good right. indication. Him and I are using the same thing, right? right? We both we both have this little I, um, session. I do walk around session. with this, and I have it in my hand, so I don't have to reach in my pocket and get an excuse to murder me. So you know they can't say I'm reaching in my pocket for something. And, um, and I I really consider it self defense. I, I want to have a camera ready at all times and. It's partly because the cops just harass people, and I live in neighborhoods where they do harass people, and it's also somewhat because they sometimes recognize me and will try to harass me, specifically. Are police body cameras the solution? Well, the problem is they have control of that. So you still have to film them because they don't release it unless it supports their story. And that's one of the things you'll notice is if it supports their story, they release it two or three days later. If it's uh, if it doesn't support it, it's two or three years later. You know, so, or not at all. Yeah, or it, uh, it, the LVMPD has a real history of making video disappear. And uh, you know, Eric Scott's one of the better known cases where Costco's cameras just happened to not be working that day. With the specific camera that would have recorded him being murdered that day. Um, there was another case not too long ago where there was a cop who was behind on the payments on a truck and a uh, trailer and he went out and lit it on fire and there was a video where he was talking to the fire department and basically admitted everything and that video somehow became corrupted <laughs> and then I have a friend also who was arrested at a peace protest an anti-drone protest and she went into the police department and she had dreadlocks and they, you know, they decided, even though it was like booking and release kind of situation, so they, she wasn't even going to be in jail very long, um, they decided they had to take the beads out of her hair. And in the process, they were like pulling like her hair out and making racist comments, calling her an animal. And she's a black person. And uh, there was a video that... There's a video that they released, which is, there's a counter that's obscuring where she's at. And also has no audio, so you can't hear those racist remarks. But in that video, you can see one of the jail guards is, has a handheld camera and is recording also. That camera somehow became corrupted. So that's the thing is, unless we have control of the video, it's not. And also the, there's the whole thing of not, you know, forgetting to turn their body cameras on. <laughs> you know, it's... Which Michael Bennett, when he was here, and the police uh, pointed a gun at his head, and uh, one of them said, you know, I'm going to blow your fucking brains out. Somehow that cop's camera, he forgot to turn his camera on. So, you know, they, uh, if they don't manipulate them, they make them disappear. So it's to our advantage to have a camera running that we're in control of. Video in the hands of the police is almost as good as nothing. They're, they're not going to... I've had several experiences where they have given it to me. One department in particular has given me the video every single time they unlawfully arrested me. But other than that, 
my experiences have been broken cameras, broken media cards. Um, you know, it, you just can't count on them to give you the video. If it, uh, if it shows them breaking the law, they're not likely to give it. What advice do you have for someone just starting to film the police? I, I would say just be careful. Try to be professional. So I'll try to imitate some shit that you see me do. Don't be shouting and cursing. If you want to, if you want to imitate um, something you see on the internet, you need to pick somebody that's intelligent, and, um, control of their emotions. Um, you know, because ultimately, making yourself look like a fool is, is not going to help your cause. And um, if you get unlawfully arrested, if you're acting like a fool, you're going to have a hard time getting any jurors to care if the arrest was lawful or not, let alone a judge or any of the attorneys. You know, if you're acting like an asshole, nobody's going to care if, if the arrest was lawful or not. So shouting and cursing is definitely not the way to go. So, and, um, and it's, I don't know if people are as uncomfortable as when, like when I started, it was really awkward and uncomfortable. I have a feeling nowadays it might not be so bad for people who, who maybe have watched years, well, um, years worth of video, so it might come naturally. But um, I think people could kind of start now where, where we've left off. You know what I mean? They could watch how things have progressed, and they can, without being on the street, I think they could probably learn how to act and what to do and what not to do before they step out of the house. Um, so just be careful and do what's comfortable and just take it one step at a time, all right? Yeah. And, and raise the bar. Send, send once, when you guys raise the bar, send me a link, show me your material and um, let me share your material. You know, I'll, I'll like and subscribe, but don't send me a video of you cussing out a cop that's parked in front of a, a fire hydrant or something. I don't care to see that. Mm -hmm. Well, I would very much second the be careful thing because you never know. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was arrested filming the police, and it was a situation where I was on Fremont Street, hanging out with some friends, and I saw a bunch of police cars heading a certain direction. And without even thinking that I was going to film, I just walked over to see what was going on, and I happened to see them. Um, the woman was t you know, yelling, take your hands off me, and there was one cop in front of her, and two or three cops coming up behind her, and I was like, shit, some, something might happen. So I hit the camera and I ended up getting arrested and in the process they picked me up and threw me in the street and uh, eventually charged me with being in the street that was one of the charges the unlawful pedestrian in the roadway is the official charge which they never prosecuted they never even filed the charges but I still went to jail for like nine hours but so the thing is you never know when the crazy cop's going to be there um, so the thing is like you should, first of all, you should tell people, because I that was one thing I messed up on, is I didn't tell any of my friends. I just walked over there, so nobody knew. Like, I happened to have a friend who came over and saw, so I was, I was able to let people know. Otherwise, it would have been hours before I could even tell anybody I got arrested. Um, you should try to film in a group. And uh, one of the things we try to do is, the person who's filming, you have somebody else maybe across the street. So they're filming from a distance, that person is filming. So if they try to say you were interfering or something, you have evidence that you weren't. And you also have somebody there that has video that they can't destroy. So um, I kind of, it's kind of my personality partly also, but I tend to prefer to let the cops be the bad guys. Clearly, let them be the bad guy. So. I don't sit and yell at the cops. I stand there and hold a camera is basically what I do. Um, there are some times like the cops will say something to somebody and then, you know, they try to tell them, you know, it's illegal to stand there or something and I'll correct them because it's not illegal to stand on a public sidewalk. So I do sometimes, you know, like speak in the videos and stuff, but I don't go out there to yell at the cops and, to, you know, antagonize them because that's basically what it is. I want them to clearly be the bad guy if they do something. And, um, yeah, I think it's really, you, you have to be safe and you have to know what you're up to. As far as, like, it being awkward and, and nervous and stuff, like, I could show you videos I did, like, in 2012 or 2013 where, like, the camera's shaking because 
that's one of the things that's an advantage to filming all the time is you get used to it and you get to where you're not intimidated by the cops because when you have this giant guy on steroids with a gun yelling at you normal person's reaction is to be intimidated and even to be afraid but if you've done it before that it's not necessarily something you're going to be you know in that situation intimidated or afraid and when you catch a video of like the cops murdering somebody you're going to have a good video and not you know a shaky video or you know a video where it's been aimed in the wrong direction or something because you've already done it a hundred times before that so so that's another advantage to filming the cops every time you see them because those hundred times that you don't catch something that hundred and first time when you do catch them it's a good video yeah I want to add something to that um, you never a lot of times you might uh, people might think oh this is nothing it's just a traffic or whatever you, you might look at something and think oh it's just routine it doesn't matter but, but um, you never know what something might be or or even just act of you standing there recording the cop you might identify a cop who obviously is uh, screw loose you know they might attack you or just even if everything is perfectly on the up and up maybe the cop comes over and introduces himself and shakes your hand and um, explains things to you so maybe you identify a good cop you know presumably a, a good cop but um, I like what he was saying there you know uh, even if nothing happens you're preparing for the time something does happen I don't ever ever I, I was over an hour late today because I stopped to every you know I had to walk away from a few incidents but I tried to record each and every police you know it's hard for me to go past the incident I, you know I pretty much I won't do it if I forget my camera that's like happens once a year or something like that and if I do come across the incident I'll be running straight back home from my camera so um, record every incident I know mo most people aren't going to do that so record every incident that you reasonably can that's how you're going to capture things and get better at it and and hopefully make a difference and, and we both already said be careful because you, you, there's a good chance you might um, face retaliation yeah. especially when you're new and they don't know you you know because because then they if you're a, a new face it I think they're more confident that they could scare you away um, and there's nothing wrong with stepping if you if you're uncomfortable or they're intimidating you there's nothing wrong with backing off or stepping back you know um, you know try again next time whatever well, that's also one of the things I do if they say like get back you're too close I'll say like where do you want me you know, like, and they try to tell you like three blocks away or something I'll say no that's not true but, but at the same time first of all like you have it on record that you're not trying to impede them you're asking them like where do you want me to go you know and then you know it's just basically puts you in a good light so like if they try to arrest you because that's the other charge I had was for um, obstruction you know from 20 feet away you know while which like, like if you watch that video the, the funny thing is and I didn't realize it at the time because I was concentrating on this giant Samoan guy three times my size that's like trying to wrestle with me um, trying to pull a camera out of my hand but there were two people standing next to me on the on the thing and then as he's going people are walking behind him between him and the person they were arresting so while he's you know bothering me and, and accusing me of obstruction people are actually obstructing <laughs> you know, so. and and the other thing is you know there's two people right next to me and the only difference between them and me is I have a camera it's one of those kind of one of those things like you want any kind of evidence you can in case it becomes an issue that supports your you know that you're not doing something that they accused you of that was a great video by the way that's that was a I forgot that you made that's it. the best video I've ever done actually <laughs> and when I when I was in jail like I was first of all I was hoping they didn't take my bit my can like the first thing I did when they really released me was look to see if my card was still there. And then when I got home, I was, see if the video when they had thrown me in the street and they're still trying to pull the camera out of my hand and stuff and I was, you know, trying to hold on to it. I could hear somebody yelling like, you know, he's not doing anything, leave him alone, this kind of stuff. And I was like, man, I hope I at least got the audio of that when they threw me in the street. And I went home and it was like perfect from start to finish video. And 
Yeah, that's that might be the that's like definitely the best video I've ever done. You've seen <laughs> you know? You've and seen even it, right? yeah. yeah. Well, even after they did finally pull the camera out of my hand, one of the cops was holding it, so he was basically filming for me. <laughs> you know, it was upside down, so I had to like flip it over. But outside of that, it was like a perfect video even then. You know? It, it kind of shows how um, how oblivious they are to the law, like. After they would do all that to you and then sit there and hold it. I mean, at yeah. no point did anyone think, hey, maybe we should not arrest this guy. Yeah. Maybe we should say we're sorry or not that, I mean, I don't know if it would have changed anything at that point, but, but taking you to jail certainly didn't make it any better. No. You know, I, I doubt to this day you never did get an apology, right? No. Uh, and and no. neither have I. Any, well, my lawyer have. went and had me file an internal affairs complaint and they sent me an email that said, um, basically, they said like our supervisor sat him down and had a talk with him. So basically, you know, they they sat him down and had a talk. So yeah, they that's didn't the extent of they, his punishment. They didn't call it unfounded or or anything like no, that. No, they actually um, was it sustained? Because I've never seen a complaint be sustained before in my life. I'm not sure if they actually said it was sustained, but they they did say like like we counseled him. Basically, is what they said. Yeah, they admitted some fault. That's good. Yeah. Because that guy was out of line. Right? right. That guy was so no, no. I, no. I Well, one of my theories on that is when when I came around and I saw that woman with the three cops converging on her, I thought, man, something might happen. And I'm thinking they thought the same thing. So they were like, even if it's illegal, we want to get rid of this guy with a camera in case we have to meet this girl. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I'm sorry. I should say you have to. But, you know. How do we bridge the divide with police employees? I feel like I do that yeah. on the regular. I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel like I have more police, even though I have a reputation for not getting along with the police. I feel like I'm, even if maybe they don't like me, but they don't, you know, they don't flat out say it. I feel like there's hundreds of police who I'm on good terms with, you know? So, I mean, that's a big step. Someone like me who criticizes, uh, criticizes them regularly, follows them around, records them, if, if they can get along with me, then they can get along with everybody because no, because the other people don't even criticize them. You know what I'm saying? Most people don't. So I, I feel like um, I feel like I've done a lot of work on that, on bridging that divide. Well, I do think like that's part of it is you get them used to being filmed also, and maybe some of them realize like it doesn't really matter that much if they're being filmed as long as they're not planning to do something. You know. Since you've started filming the police, what has changed? That's a difficult question. Um, like, I think I, uh, I think I already. I don't know if I told you off camera or on, but I mean things have changed tremendously in my neighborhood for me. You know, like, but I don't know if that translates. How, how much of that translates into the way other people are treated? Like, a long time ago, I could just go on a five-mile bike ride and I could find police treating people like shit up and down the. You know, mostly you're probably bicycles, but, but even people in cars would be searching and just treating people like shit. And, and, uh, and now it's hard for me to find that. Now I find officers saying hello or, or immediately letting people go. Um, and, and I think other people have been empowered. I'm not the only person, obviously I'm not the only person recording. You know, I've, I've gone with a, a lot of younger um, kids in the community that wanted to record. And so like, I think other people are doing it. Um, and, and like I said, it's not easy for me to find, it's not, I can't necessarily, now I can ride around, I might record the police, but they're all behaving themselves. You know, that was maybe before I came to Las Vegas. Since I've been here, I've been wearing the handcuffs again, but I anticipate, you know, that that's gonna stop in short order. So, hopefully things are changing, and, and hopefully for everybody. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, there's that um, saying you, that people get the police they deserve, so I don't know if that comes into play. You know, people might have to step up and try to defend themselves and their neighbors and their friends, especially if you're in a community that's being abused. Um, and I know there's some communities that's a really difficult task. Like I'm, I'm thinking like South Central Los Angeles. I, like even though I could ride through there and record, I don't know if that the residents could just grab a camera and start recording. I feel like they might get their asses beat. So like I don't know, I don't know what the answer is for them. Well, yeah, I do think there's a lot of 
the, the biggest change I think is awareness and I think 10 years ago and, and part of it's technological because everybody has a cell phone in their pocket with a camera so um, but 10 years ago people weren't as as apt to go out and record the place and now the first response if people see something is to pull their camera out and start recording and the other thing about that is you know 10 years ago also if the police would have said you know you're not allowed to record me most people would believe them and I think nowadays people realize that they are allowed to record them so I think that's probably the biggest change is just an awareness and a propensity to do stuff like that to get out your camera and record when you see the police Yes. Uh, uh, well, let me add some, one thing Please. to that, if I can. You know the, that show Cops uh, on, I don't know, it was a key, whatever channel, Channel 11 or whatever. I don't know how long that show played, for decades, right? Everybody, by, that's my mom's favorite show. You know, she, we root for opposite sides because she's like, get them. She thinks everybody's guilty of something and like she roots for the police. But, but my point is that everybody in America has been watching that show. So there's no doubt that recording the police is entertaining. So it's even more entertaining if you get off your couch and you actually get involved. You know what I'm saying? Like sitting on the couch, it's, it's pre-recorded and you're just showing the clips they give you. There's a whole lot more adventure in taking your camera and actually getting involved. Uh, um, there's more danger too and, and different things, but, but if you're entertained by that TV show, go be entertained by the reality. Because it's, it's right outside the door, you know? Part of the thing about that is those TV shows are designed to make you think everybody's in the wrong when they're stopped by the police because they only show the people that are in the wrong. They don't show the other, you know, they don't show the 90% of the people they stop that aren't doing anything. So that's really the, the reason they put those out there. It's, it's uh, propaganda is what it really is. And I should point out I've been stopped by the cops crew. <laughs> I was, uh, and I was dressed as a pirate at the time because I was, I was riding my bike to Ren Fair dressed as a pirate and they stopped me and I turn around and there's a guy holding a boom mic and I'm like, what the fuck, you know? <laughs> and then, uh, um, well, by the end, the cop threatened to shoot me and uh, or told me he wanted to shoot me and I ended up arguing with the cop's photographer, <laughs> film guy because he thought he was... I had my bike chain in my giant pirate out my jacket, which the cop also asked me, he's like, why are you wearing a big jacket in October? And I'm like, I'm headed to the Ren Fair, I'm dressed as a pirate. And he's like, what's Ren Fair? And I'm like, I'm not explaining Ren Fair to you. <laughs> you know? But uh, so they wanted to search my pocket and he tries to tell me, oh, I think that's a gun. And I'm like, that's not, doesn't look or, or feel anything like a gun. You know, you see, I'm not allowing you to search me. So the camera guy thought he was going to convince me to let him, you know, he was going to come over and be like my buddy and convince me and then he started carrying on about how I was just like the activist in Portland which apparently he hates activists in Portland and and I'm like I don't even think you're supposed to be a part of this <laughs> you know, like but uh, yeah so I don't think they ever played it but I was on I was stopped by the cops crew but uh, that's what I was going to say, I don't yeah. think you made the cut right? <laughs> I didn't make yeah. the cut if you're arguing <laughs> But it was funny when I turned around and then and there's a guy with a fucking boom mic, like like yeah. you see in the movies. It wasn't even like like a small one or anything. That also kind of shows how the police could seem they could work with cameras no problem so long as they're the ones controlling it. You know what I mean? Like the cops, like the photographers yeah. running right there with them. Well, and that's the other so. thing is um, while they were filming, he was being nice and really like talking nice to me and everything. When they turn that camera off, that's when he's like, don't put your hands in your pockets, I don't want to have to shoot you. And I said, so you're implying that you're going to shoot me? And he's like, no, I'm saying it. You know, so he's, yeah. Too bad you didn't have your camera on at the time. Exactly, yeah. Well, that was one of those, the, I was in a hurry to go to the Ren Fair, and I got like two blocks away, and I was like, damn, I forgot my camera. And I was like, oh, I don't want to go back. And of course, I get stopped. That's, that's right. And the first thing he's like, I, I started to reach for my cell phone so I could record, and he's like, "Don't put your hands in your pockets." So I'm like, "I'm not giving you a reason to murder me," you know. What are your thoughts on streaming apps? If I could just stream one of my regular cameras, which I'm not sure. I think maybe some GoPros allow that. The quality on uh, 
on the phone I'm using now is much better, but it's still it's still crap. So I pretty much only fire my stream up if I'm scared I'm going to be going to jail and like I'm scared they're going to be getting the footage and nobody's going to know where I'm at. Then I'll be trying to frantically fire up the stream. Or sometimes I'll do it just like socially just to say hello to viewers, but um, I feel like it's, um, for me, it's kind of self-defeating because the, the quality and the content always ends up being crap. So if if I'm not doing it strictly for let's try to defend myself or or maybe myself and others around me, um, it's kind of counterproductive. Uh, supposedly there's a way to stream with my that camera, but it's I can't do it to YouTube. I have to do it through some other new stream or something, and and I don't have no idea how to do that. Um, yeah, if I could stream my regular good camera, I mean, and, and actually that's an interesting question because, like, I would pay. I would pay for it. You know, like I just uh, the the budget, or, or I think I'm using. Um, I forget the name of the service right now. It slips my mind because I just changed to it because Sprint was spotty. Like my streams would just cut in and out. So I switched, I did some research and I switched to whatever one was the best. I think it's T-Mobile, but it's um, the carrier or somebody else that's using the T-Mobile network. I would pay I would pay two, three, four times as much as I'm paying for my cell phone if I could get four times the bandwidth and, and stream to that. You know, if I could stream HD, I would pay for it, literally. But there's no option. All you get to pay for is your monthly service. They don't have an option to, to quadruple your bandwidth with your cell phone that I know of, because I would have done it. Or at least I would I would have probably doubled it, seen, you know, and however many steps up it takes to to stream properly. I don't know why they, um, it seems like, like you were saying, if the budget was unlimited, but I think then you need a, like a van with a big ass pole that comes out and a satellite thing, which, that's probably out of reach. I don't understand why a cell phone provider can't provide the bandwidth that I need to, to stream in um, HD or something, you know, and, and reliably. I would definitely pay for it. It's, it would be worth it. Yeah, I do wish the GoPros had streaming. They do have Wi-Fi, but you have to upload it after the fact. Um, one of the things that I like is um, with the Wi-Fi is you can control that, I think, from 100 feet away. So. I haven't actually done this yet, but I'd like to try have having somebody else connected to the GoPro and standing, you know, 100 feet away, controlling it. Um, that way, if something happened, then they could upload it. But uh, I think probably the best option right now is cell 411. The one drawback with that is there's not enough people on it. I wish everybody would join it so they would be really effective, because functionally it's effective. It's just there's not enough people on it. Um, I do a lot of times when I'm filming I will try to stream and sometimes I do like Facebook live because that's most convenient and I would just do that like for a minute or something so people know I'm filming and if something happens and they don't hear from me for you know hours later then they know something you know I might have got arrested or they know the check at least you know so I I think that's the thing is like the cell phone cameras aren't good enough quality wise and they get disconnected and Facebook has the ability so if you use Facebook live they have the ability the police can call Facebook and tell them to cut your stream off and to delete it also which has happened three or four times uh, so as far as filming I find like for me as far as my budget the best option is a GoPro and that's partly also because it's really convenient the one I have now, um, it's one button, you push it, it turns it on and starts the, the uh, video. So you don't have to fumble around trying to you know, turn it on and start it, which was kind of a problem before. And, but the problem is you don't have that streaming, so there's the, they could steal your card and, and um, they could delete it, which a lot of times you can get it back, but then if they steal the whole car altogether, then you're screwed. So that's why it would be really good if there was a good quality camera that had the ability to stream live. I, I think there's actually phones that have ex excellent cameras now, but you're still limited by the 
um, the bandwidth and the yeah. and your connection. And right? you, say so no, you get cut off, and, and yeah. like I said, like if you're using Facebook, then you're at the mercy of the Facebook. You know, they could cut you off. But you should be able to connect your. You should be able to get enough bandwidth through your phone to connect, even, even a 4K if you're willing to pay for it. I don't know. I'm not sure if that if there's a technical limitation. Or it's part of the towers and stuff, I guess. I'm but sure. I mean, you, if you could have four phones in your pocket and using them all, why couldn't you have one that yeah. is going to use? Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah. That's a good question. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm sure. I'm. I'm poor. Like I'm broke. And I would, but I would pay for that. That would come second after my rent, mm -hmm. just to be able to. Um, for one, think of all the time I would save editing. Mm -hmm. If I could, if I could just stream the quality content, I wouldn't have to go home and transfer the shit on my computer and spend twelve hours editing a video. When I, when I, press the stop button from recording, my work would be done. So like that would save me a whole day. I could be out right. recording again instead of having to be stuck in the house editing or, or rendering or uploading. So. I mean, and that's that's a time is money, right? And that's where I mean, I, that's how come I don't even hardly upload a lot of the stuff I make is because I'd rather be out recording. If I could do both, I could record it and do it all at once. That would be awesome. It seems in, in today's technology, I actually did. I, I, I'm able to live stream from my Mavic, you know, a drone. So why the hell can I not live stream from that? That's I mean. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You both ride a bicycle. Why? If you're going to be recording to police, I, I mean, unless you're in the country or some driving, or if you're driving this, you know, a faraway thing where I record, it's always within a mile or two. It doesn't make any sense at all to wear out your brakes. You know, you're going to be on the accelerator, the brakes, that you're going to get, the cops are going to retaliate and give you tickets. Not that they won't do it on a bicycle, but... Um, besides all that, cool people ride bicycles. Look at Kelly, myself, Pete Air. I mean, oh, cool people. think about it. Why would we? We're not riding bicycles <laughs> because we're because we're dumb or, well, you know, what? There's a, um, I don't know, what, I forget what you call it. You know, people think of bicyclists. If you're not Lance Armstrong, then you're a loser. You're a tweaker. Get the get the f out of the way, like honking the horn. You know just because everyone thinks they're better than you. But when they're sitting in traffic going nowhere and I'm riding by, you can think what you want. I know you're not better than me, you're stupid. You're sitting there wasting gas and time and, and uh, instead of relieving stress, you're building stress and you're gonna go home and, and live. I mean, you're gonna die of heart disease and I'm gonna be stress-free, stress happy riding and getting where I'm going. So besides the recording of the police part, it makes more sense. Um, I know people that drive car, like my friend, um, Catman, on this news, he thought I was crazy. When we first started recording, he would drive, and then I'd be like, dude, you need a bike. It's not gonna work. You, I'm not, you're gonna run back and forth to your car, it's not, you need a bike. And uh, he told me recently, he's like, he thought he, I was crazy, like, I need to get a car. It's like, no, dude, I have a car. That's, you need to get a bike if you're gonna record with me. You need to get a bike. That's how we do it. Um, and I no longer, I don't have cars. Or I don't, the only thing I have now is a bike and I love it. So, I mean, a lot of people that maybe it's not going to work, they'll say, I have to drive 20 miles to work. Yeah. Well, you might as well ride and save yourself some time. You don't have to go to the gym. I, I, could, I could talk for an hour about all the benefits of riding a bicycle, but I think everybody already knows them. But they're, for one, they're, they might be too lazy, but number two, probably most importantly nobody would be caught dead on a bicycle because the, their self-image whatever they would be ashamed embarrassed and i think that says a lot about what kind of person you are if you're so weak that you wouldn't dare be seen on a bicycle like i mean i, I don't know it's just silly mm -hmm. yeah. it, you could have a nice car but put it in the garage mm -hmm. use your and save it for you know when it's appropriate Sitting in traffic is not the time for a nice car, I don't think. Okay, I said more than my share on that. That's good. All right. Well, I'll just say I haven't had a car since 2003. And uh, probably the original reason for that was because I was driving a truck, so I was barely home, so it didn't make sense for me to pay payments on a car that I was never using. Um, but when I stopped driving the truck, it was 2008, and the fuel prices were so high that it, once again it wasn't something I wanted to do. 
So I just went back to riding a bike. And I used to ride a bike when I was a kid. So it was like, like I said, going back to it. And you realize when you ride a bike, first of all, it's not as dangerous as everybody makes it out to be. Um, even it's, it's actually less dangerous to drive in traffic. Everybody gets really carried on about like, you know, you're driving in traffic, but it's actually more dangerous to be on the sidewalk because people aren't looking for you on the sidewalk. But as far as traffic and everything, when you figure in the traffic and the gridlock and the you know lights and everything that you have to stop for, there's not that big of a difference time-wise. Like I can ride across town in 45 minutes and in a car it might take you half an hour. So it's really not that big of a difference. And if they let me go on the freeway, I'd really be making some time. <laughs> Which if they put like a bike lane in the middle, I wish they would do that because you could actually feasibly use the freeway on a bike if they did that. But the uh, thing is, as far as filming, um, I go out and I do like 70 mile bike rides sometimes. And so I'm out all over the city for you know three or four hours. And sometimes I come across the cops and I have a GoPro on my handlebars and I can sit and film them and they don't even know I'm filming them. As far as they know, I'm just stopping to take a break. So it's, it's a really convenient way to get around. Um, and as far as like, you know, it's, it's really, you have a lot of time to think and everything. So if you're talking about like just the basic benefits of having a bike and it is like, you don't have to spend three hours at a gym working out because you've already done your exercise, just getting around. But it's also for filming, it's really convenient because you're all over the place and you can run into the cops just randomly and you're set up to film. You just put, you know, a camera on your handlebars and just stop and film them. Any final thoughts? Where can folks find you? My closing is probably be the same thing that I opened with. Was that it's just awesome to, to have met you, Pete. And uh, I've met you before, Kelly, but I think this is the most we ever sat down and talked. Yeah. So it's like an honor to be here with you guys. So, and uh, yeah, it's just a pleasure. I'm glad to have participated. For sure, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. no, it's good to hang oh. out and, um, you know, before this I hadn't seen you in a long time and it's always good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I learned a lot from you in the early days of what I was doing activist-wise and, and getting involved with Cobb Luck and originally it was something that really like moved me forward in, in awareness and then, you know, just being an active. Um, as far as where you can find me, the, the main place would be nvcopblock.org. Um, you can f go on Facebook for you know Nevada Cop Lock there. Um, our new podcast is ACAB Radio. Um, I think if you look for ACAB Radio Las Vegas, you'll probably find it pretty easily. Um, Food Not Bombs Las Vegas is the other place. Uh, online, that would be foodnotbombslasvegas.org, and it's all one big word. Uh, there's also a Facebook page, um, et cetera, you know. So uh, I kind of like on, I'm on social media a lot, but I'm usually just sharing stuff. I don't have a lot of time to hang out and like read stuff. So I, I don't spend a lot of time like on Facebook or anything. Um, but we're also on YouTube. There's also the, the Bad A Cop Up channel. There's, we have an ACAB radio channel where we post our pods, podcasts. So, probably if you just search for me on the Google, you'll, you'll find like 50 billion links to me. Cool. Where do we find you? Where do we find you? What did you say? Tom Zebra. It's simple. It's easy. Tom Zebra. But, um, right? You, uh, you've, been, you've been hiding for a while. So, where, are we gonna, where do we find I don't know. I mean, I mean, I still have a Twitter profile. I, I use it a little bit, but... Um, but yeah, Beyond the Badge is what I'm working on, and also kind of a little bit behind the scenes more with Nevada Cop, like just a post it, time to time. And Is there anything that, um, that I or that we could do to help promote that Beyond the Badge? Is that going to be on, on YouTube or on yeah, Facebook? Yeah, eventually. Or yeah, my friend Joshua um, is yeah. going to do the Facebook component, and then I'll do the Twitter. But it's still, maybe in a couple of weeks, I'd say it'll be in a better spot to like start sort of... Pushing okay. it out a bit more. Just once we get a little bit more content on there. Uh, that's a catchy name. I like it. Yeah, Round the badge. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Cool. Well, well, there's, yeah, if there's anything this, yeah. anything I could do to help. Cool. I, I, I spent that. years 
trying to get your attention, help promote my stuff, you know? Like, oh, man. If there's ever anything I could do to help oh. promote yours, please let Likewise, me know. Likewise, man. That's good. Well, also, if you go on the Vatica blog, we do have a submission tab. So if you have a personal story, or even if you just see a link that you think needs coverage, you can always send that to us. Um, and if you go on the front page, there's a link for it. So. Cool. Cool. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you, guys.